We pray. With God, we give you thanks for the gift of the scriptures, and we pray that you might open them to us now, that we might hear and understand what it is that you have to say to us this morning. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Abraham Lincoln, when he was nominated for the Senate in 1858, launched his campaign with a famous speech that included this line. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. We know that in times of division, today's scripture has spoken to people and politicians alike. And we live in a time of division unlike anything most of us have ever experienced. You know that already, that's obvious, it's cliche, but still it must be said because it's the starting point for our messages over these next few weeks. Your pastors pray that this series will provide you with some ideas and some tools to help you navigate the divisions in our politics, in our churches, and in our families, and all those places where those spheres overlap for us. I'm certain that many of you, for example, are already dreading the visit home at Thanksgiving if you've decided to go at all, because you know that it's likely, likely to leave you uh, in the midst of uncomfortable conversations about politics, about coronavirus precautions, about whatever. And none of this is easy. There's no one size fits all, no one clear cut bit of advice that we can give here, but let's see what it is that we can do to help based on the message today that we find in the scriptures. So all three of the divisions that I mentioned, politics, church, family, they all come together in this text. Jesus stands opposed by the religious authorities who come from Jerusalem. They're throwing around accusations that will only grow in their severity until Jesus winds up before Pilate, who's the ultimate civil authority in Judea. And he's accused of claiming kingship for himself. Here what's happening is he's being charged with blasphemy and he's facing questions about whether his power comes from God or whether it comes from somewhere else. And just to illustrate the level of resistance that Jesus faces, Mark includes details about how Jesus' family, in the middle of this ministry of healing, how they want to detain him and restrain him because they fear that Jesus has just lost it. Jesus seems to react to that development a little later in this chapter. When his mom and his brothers show up and they're looking for him, he responds by saying, well, who are my mother and my brothers? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus doesn't sound all that happy with his people in that moment. So maybe the first lesson is this. Jesus didn't always get along with his family either. And I hope that gives you a small bit of consolation if your own relationships haven't been so easy as of late. And so what does Jesus do? He chooses to redefine his family in a way. He chooses to redefine that family around a key point. Who is it that's doing the will of God? Now that's a hard question for us to answer, but I want us to hold on to it because it may be useful as we consider this more deeply. When we read the scriptures, we often hear what I would call an imperative for unity, and especially an imperative for unity in the church. If you think about how Jesus prays for unity in John 17, 22, you know this verse probably by heart. Let them be one as we are one. If it's Jesus' prayer, how can that be anything other than the will of God for us? But we know when we read the scriptures, that the reality of the early church was anything but that. It was anything but unified. Take a look, for example, at what Paul says in Galatians 5.12 when he's writing about the controversy over circumcision. I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. That's what he writes. Now, you don't hear that passage quoted in a whole lot of sermons. So Jesus, on the one hand, tells us that a house divided against itself cannot stand, and yet Paul, the leading missionary in the generation after the apostles, seems to have spent much of his ministry actively fighting against factions in the church who would limit the spread of the gospel, who would limit the message of salvation by making it more difficult for Gentiles to become followers of Jesus. So what this tells me is that the notion of unity, the notion of crossing the divide, has to be something a lot deeper than Hey, let's put aside our differences. Just everybody get along. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than that because whether we're talking about politics or church or family, there is a lot at stake. The decisions we make in our families, for example, whether to heal relationships or to cut them off, they're not just decisions that affect us as individuals. 
those choices may have ripple effects for generations. And I know this firsthand. My father had a significant cutoff with one of his sisters for many years, so I had never met my cousins from the Boston area Monahans until my uncle, who happens to be a retired United Methodist pastor, good morning, Uncle Bob, not until Uncle Bob and his wife Mary Jane had an anniversary and reunion celebration a few years ago. Otherwise, I never would have known that part of my family. So there's a lot at stake in our families when we're deciding whether to work through differences or just end a relationship altogether. There's even more at stake when we talk about things like rights and justice and equity and equality. Because when we have those kinds of conversations, those political conversations, we're talking literally about people's lives. A lot of Americans are really quite anxious in this moment. Those who have lost jobs and are struggling to hold on to homes and their apartments during this pandemic, they're certainly anxious right now. Many of our black and brown and LGBTQ siblings are anxious right now. Our politics, they have consequences. Our church policies, they have consequences. Political thinking might begin as a series of abstract ideas or beliefs, you know, freedom of thought and speech and all of that. But with freedom comes responsibility because words that we speak into the air, they become ideas that cause people to write them into laws. The laws on the books become lived reality for millions of people. And that's no joke. You may remember a couple of years ago in a sermon, I told a story about the reunion of the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church South that happened in 1939 when they came together to form the Methodist Church. At the conference that brought two of the largest strands of Methodism back together nearly 100 years after they'd split over slavery, Many of the black delegates to the conference wept openly on the floor. Why? Well, because in the midst of this great celebration of unity for the mostly white church, black churches and black pastors had been segregated into the central jurisdiction. That's a structure that we didn't fully dismantle until 1972. That was the cost of unity. That was the cost of unity, much as the three-fifths compromise had been the cost of unity at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. So unity must be something much more than just, hey, let's all agree to get along. As Christians, as United Methodists, people are way too important for us to be so cavalier that we would seek that unity at any cost. So when we read that a house divided cannot stand, when we hear Jesus' prayer as an imperative for unity in the nation, in the church, in the family, what are we to do? Do we stop praying for? Do we stop working for? Do we stop voting for the things that we believe in just so that we can all get along? Well, no, of course not. Paul never stopped arguing for what he believed in because he believed that the people he was arguing for mattered. And yet, Here's the challenge. There are moments when we will decide to make allowances for the sake of relationships. Moments where we will choose to overlook even significant differences for the sake of maintaining our connections to people. We'll do that. Where we decide having someone in our life is worth the cost of disagreement, even over deeply held beliefs. Sometimes, especially in families and among friends, that's the strategy that we need to follow. Now, it may not always feel great. We may wonder whether we are betraying our values or just choosing to avoid uncomfortable conversations. But I do believe that at times, believing that people matter means centering relationships in our decision-making. After all, Jesus must have patched things up with his mother and at least one of his brothers, even though their initial response to his ministry was to question his sanity. Mary was at the cross. James became a leader in the Jerusalem church. Sometimes centering relationships in our decision-making creates space for ongoing development in someone's understanding. But when you choose to cut off a relationship, you no longer have any ability to influence. You don't have any ability to cross a divide anymore. You just perpetuate that divide. You lock it in. As Methodists, we have three simple rules that John Wesley tried to live by. 
do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. And there are these moments when doing no harm to a relationship comes into direct conflict with the harm that you believe someone is inflicting on others through their political or religious beliefs. Jesus was not afraid of offending his opponents by telling them exactly where he stood in no uncertain terms. Likewise, Paul was not afraid of offending even those who would come to faith under his preaching as he did with the Galatians. Sometimes we make decisions about how to handle difference based on how important and how close those relationships are to us. Other times, we make decisions about how to navigate a relationship based on what we believe is at stake. Which brings me back to Jesus' comment about his family. My family are those who do the will of God. In the church, in our political conversations, it's important to remember Jesus' mission. What we believe is that he came to be the Savior for all. He came to show God's boundless love for all. That's what we preach. What that says to me is that we can't sacrifice people for the sake of unity. That was the message of Jesus, and that was the message of Paul, pushing back against their opponents, that people matter. It should matter to us when people are hurting. It should matter to us when people feel ignored and excluded from our life, whether in the church or as a nation. Because we believe that God's love, God's grace is for all people. Jesus in this passage draws this really strange analogy. He likens himself to a thief. Can you imagine? He's a thief. He's a thief that's come to rob the devil's house. That's what he's here for. And he's doing that through healings. He's doing that by extending God's forgiveness to those who never expected to receive it. He's doing that by laying down his life and then taking it back up again. In all of these things, he is stealing back souls from hopelessness and despair. And he's giving people a new birth. He's giving people a new start. He's giving people a new life. He does this because people matter. A house divided against itself cannot stand. What Jesus says is absolutely true. But whenever we look to heal divisions, whenever we look to cross divides, we have to remember this. People have to be at the center. That's what Jesus would have us do. That's his way. When we commit to follow him, we commit to relationships. We commit to doing no harm. Because following him means committing to the belief that people matter. If there's one idea that will help us to cross the divides that we face, I believe it's that. People matter. So this week, go forth to be the healers of the breach and restorers of relationships. Go forth to proclaim not just an end to division, but an active commitment to the idea that people matter. Amen.